Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. It's Demetrius here again from Pixel. Let me take you a little bit deeper today into the actual problem that we have currently right now across the world with this CrowdStrike global systems meltdown that we've seen in the last couple of days and we'll probably continue to see for the next few weeks because it's taken going to take a long time to fix. What I've done is I've prepared a little presentation for you uh, just to break down a little bit more in terms of technical details behind this problem. So for those of you who are quite technical, you'll understand this. For those of you who are not technical, it doesn't matter. I've broken it down in such a way that it makes it easy to understand. And uh, you, you can download this PDF anytime you want. If you're interested, I don't ask for contact information or email addresses or anything like that. So let's go through it and let's break down some of the things that have happened behind this. And also let's understand how we can actually solve this problem relatively quickly but in the right way and of course you've got to be a bit more skilled to be able to do this and have the right credentials but this can be sorted out so let's break this down a little bit further right so in this document i'm going to explore this recent crowd strike issue that pretty much is a widespread instability across the board and it resulted in blue screens of death across millions of machines across the world you see we will delve into the technical aspects of what we call kernel mode operations and user mode operations and just examine sort of the root cause of the problem and i'll just give you some step-by-step -step instructions on how to resolve this issue it's not it is a comprehensive aim uh, guide but it's not really complicated as a guide and hopefully it'll help administrators and cybersecurity experts and even somebody who's not understanding the technicality behind this just to get an understanding of what really happens under the hood all right let's progress forward so Let's look at this actual problem that has happened. Okay, so in terms of CrowdStrike and this global systems meltdown, which emerged on the 18th to the 19th of July, which is pretty big and it's gone worldwide, this highlights a delicate balance that all cybersecurity professionals know and uh, between sort of cybersecurity measures and system instability or stability usually. Uh, of course, this unprecedented event has shown machines around the world going into bricking mode, as in blue screen of death, the BSOD, and causing widespread disruption across 24,000 customer locations and over 100 sectors globally on every single country in the world. Now, there's obviously an increased concern here, right, between IT professionals and also end users when it comes to this, because there's a lot of people being disadvantaged, even close to sort of mission critical systems. Now, at its core, the issue stemmed effectively from a faulty update in the CrowdStrike software, or the Falcon software, which, by the way, I'm not dissing the software in any way. It is phenomenal software. It is well designed to do incident handling, real-time threat analytics, picking up malware. It's really well designed. However, this is a widely deployed cybersecurity solution, and it's designed to protect against advanced threats, not just normal threats. This is where the problem lies. The update inadvertently introduced errors in the CrowdStrike code, leading to system crashes and instability. So this incident is a stark reminder of the complexity, really, that's involved in having a robust cybersecurity profile uh, while we're still trying to ensure smooth system operations. Now, let's break this down. We need to understand how systems work and to do that we need to understand how CrowdStrike in this case works so you can understand why CrowdStrike ended up bricking up all these systems with blue screens of death and turning these systems off the networks and now having to force people to go into remote access would not be possible but physical access having to go into physical access to go in and modify the systems when we have programs that run on computers they'll run into what we call a user space so applications libraries those things that we talk to so that we can communicate with software and the user processes that the users do, those operate in what we call the user space, which is a restricted access area, right? And it's all accessible via the application program interfaces, the APIs that talk to the applications. And those applications then talk down to whatever system they need to talk down, whether it's other code, whether it's another program, whether it's the operating system, or when it goes down to kernel level and it has to talk to the operating system's kernel, which is quite an important area. Now, in the kernel space, this is where we have 
the direct communications from the Windows operating system kernel, the driving force behind the operating system, the brains of the operation. And the kernel space communicates with the CPU, the RAM, the disk management, the, the GPU, the graphics processor and all that. And of course, when it does communicate, it communicates down to the hardware layer, which we call the hardware extraction layer. And usually that's the CPU, the RAM, the disk, the, you know, all that kind of stuff is the physical hardware. So you don't really communicate directly to the hardware via the user space. You, you should never be able to do that. And of course, the kernel space does communicate down towards the hardware. But here's the thing in the kernel space and the hardware space, this is where we need privileged access. Obviously, otherwise you would allow any malicious threat actor to be able to manipulate a piece of hardware straight from an application, which we don't want to do. OK, so the kernel space protects the hardware from the users. All right. But it does act as an intermediary. Now, here's the problem. And this is where CrowdStrike operates. OK, you see, to understand how CrowdStrike is working, you've got to understand that it's actually operating in the hardware and the kernel space, but effectively from the kernel space. So inside the kernel mode, kernel mode operates at the highest privilege level with the operating system. OK, and it manages core functions such as hardware interaction, memory management, process scheduling, which effectively is kind of analogous to like, um, say, uh, sorry, analogous uh, to say something like uh, having a top level security clearance in a company. The kernel mode has unfederated, unrestricted access to the system resources. So you can understand the problem here. So unfortunately, this power comes with significant responsibility and accountability. You see, errors in kernel mode can lead to catastrophic system failures, such as the blue screen of death that's been experienced around the world because of this CrowdStrike issue. Whereas you see an error inside the user space would probably just crash the application, probably just crash a little bit of the RAM that's been used by the machine, and then you can actually reboot the application and you're up and running. Whereas a kernel level error will have essentially a catastrophic system failure. And this is what happens. You see, when the kernel detects that there is a catastrophic problem, it needs to shut down. It has to shut down. You see, the thing is, when kernels detect a problem like this, any kind of kernel, it is its primary directive, okay, it is to protect the system. So its primary directive is to no longer continue with that crash. In other words, it mustn't destroy anything else in that system. It has to protect all the hardware. It has to protect the kernel, it has to protect the GPU, the CPU, the RAM, the disk. It has to protect them. So further than running any further malicious, potentially dangerous or error code, the kernel issues instructions down to the system, to the kernel low level, to the hardware and says, boom, I'm not going to boot up. It purposefully tries to protect itself. OK, whereas in a user mode, well, if an application program or program, whatever crashes, <laughs> the program just crashes. It notifies the kernel that this has happened, but the kernel goes, OK, it goes and protects the necessary hardware where it needs to protect, but the application just needs to be restarted. So in other words, it doesn't in any way affect the system itself. It'll just be an application closure. It won't be an entire system failure. But the problem is because the kernel has to protect the system, it has to shut it down. And in, in here lies or herein lies the problem. OK, now in user mode, the user mode in contrast operates with restricted access to critical system resources. It's quite restrictive and based on the API hooks as an application program interface hooks, the, the way programs talk down to the kernel layers and the, oper the operating system, it's where most sort of applications run in less privilege possible and it's a safer environment for obvious reasons. Otherwise, again, any attacker could send a malicious attack through, them, through an application and manipulate all the way down to hardware. So think of user mode as a guest in a house, right? The guest in the house is allowed to use certain areas, but is barred from accessing the critical systems, like they're not allowed to manipulate, say, the electricity system, the gas system, that kind of thing. Now, this separation 
ensures that errors in the user mode applications don't typically result in system-wide crashes, maintaining overall stability and security, which is, by the way, what the idea is of a lot of developers when they're doing testing, a lot of programs when they're being de developed and compiled, a lot of unit testing. Um, this is what, for example, uh, the Falcon software from CrowdStrike does test. It looks for applications crashing, trying to force any danger into the kernel and tries to avoid those things from getting any further. The problem is CrowdStrike issue began at the kernel level and that's where the real issue comes in. You see CrowdStrike's role with that Falcon sensor it operates in kernel mode, right? So here the problem is because it needs to be as effective as possible to pick up these kind of attacks, it has to operate effectively. And to do that, it has to be at kernel level, the way it's been designed, so it can protect the system completely. Now, the problem is this high level access, as in high credentials access, unfederated access, allows it to intercept and analyze the system calls that are coming from the API hooks that are coming from the programs, coming down into the kernel layer to communicate with the hardware. And by intercepting these signals, they can very quickly uh, do real-time threat analytics and be very accurate in terms of picking up malicious threats. However, as the, re the recent issue has demonstrated, this power also means that the errors in CrowdStrike's code can be far-reaching in terms of their consequences and system stability. You see, when you have errors in the code that are not well tested, they're not well federated, they're not well approved, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to have real problems. Now, the anatomy of this blue screen, so you can get an understanding of what's going on. It's officially known as the blue screen of death, right? The BSOD. And it occurs when Windows, the Microsoft operating system, encounters a critical error that it cannot safely recover from and it forces the system to either reboot or shut down. By the way, this is in no way unique to Microsoft Windows. Windows has the blue screen of death. Mac has a gray screen or sometimes a pink screen of death and the Linux operating system has a black screen of death. There's no separation of where this would happen. If a kernel level problem exists, even in source code, it will render the system unusable irrespective of this is a Windows system or a Mac system or a Linux system. There's no differentiation here. So please don't misunderstand and think that this is a Microsoft problem because it's not a Microsoft problem. Okay. You see, the thing is, when these errors typically happen, right, they occur in the kernel mode. The driver fails, the system files fail, and they can no longer communicate with the hardware, which effectively reports back and says, I've got hardware malfunctions. In this scenario, CrowdStrike's issue, in terms of this, the blue screens were triggered by a faulty update that compromised the integrity of the actual critical system that is running inside the kernel mode. So this resulted in the kernel being unable to access the necessary data in the disk, the RAM that's on the system and the CPU for processing, which ultimately leads to a cascade of errors culminating in the complete screen, uh, the, the, the system crash as in the blue screen. So understanding that this are not anatomy really is quite important uh, because it'll help you resolve these issues. Okay. Now, here's the problem where CrowdStrike has possibly gone wrong, which is always a growing concern here. More and more frequently today, we are relying more and more on more advanced software that does dig deep between the user layer and the kernel layer and down to hardware layer so that we can detect truly real-time, heavily advanced threats out there in the industry. But because of that, well, we are leaving ourselves a little bit exposed here. And there's a, it's very difficult to solve this problem. You see, CrowdStrike, like many cybersecurity providers, they face the challenge of balancing, okay? Sort of a rapid response to this, these emerging threats and at the same time, thorough testing and certification behind those tests. Now, here's the thing which, which strikes me very confusing. 
And that is when you develop applications, even in the Microsoft platform, Linux platform, Mac platform, they all have their own type of solution. Microsoft's Windows Hardware Quality Labs, the WHQL, is actually a certification process that is designed to ensure that drivers and software is interacting with the kernel in a stable and reliable way before deployment. Okay, now you see, when I've developed applications in the past for Microsoft platforms and I've worked with Microsoft before, I am very well aware of the process of when we develop programs and they have to access that kind of layer. There is this Windows Hardware Quality Lab certification process, right? That it has to be approved throughout the process, throughout unit testing, constant testing, way before it even gets deployed on live systems. However, CrowdStrike's approach, unfortunately, really sometimes warrants agility, like it prioritizes speed. And because of that, it allows for dynamic updates to respond quickly to new security threats. However, when you have those kind of updates, to have that kind of dynamic speed of response, it needs to operate in kernel level. And that's where the problem is, because this sometimes means that it's bypassing the lengthy the really lengthy recertification process, meaning it's no longer going to execute necessarily on the application level or the, what we call the user mode. It's going to have to go and execute inside the actual kernel mode. And here's the problem. They've updated code inside the kernel mode, which does execution rather than just communicating with the actual physical hardware. So it physically execute additional code. The trade-off is it enables for faster protection, yes, but on an occasional basis, it leads to issues like what we're experiencing today. The, the, the problem is this time, these systems have been read, rendered unusual, uh, unused, and unfortunately, there is no way to remotely access these systems to be able to fix this problem because it's happened at the kernel and hardware layer. It's not necessarily happened between the user and the kernel mode. It's happened between the kernel mode and the hardware, so it's happened much lower, right? So this incident really highlights ongoing debates, right? That cybersecurity community, like myself in the community, really has to think about how we're going to balance speed of results and speed of response with the stability of software updates. It is, it is an ongoing question, not an easy thing to solve. So here's the root cause and analysis behind this. I've broken down a number of steps that are quite important for anybody who's interested in trying to solve this problem relatively quickly. And I've tried to, I've tried to simplify the steps, although it does require someone who's well trained. I've tried to simplify these steps. The only problem you will probably find is more than likely you'll have some problems with systems that unfortunately will require you to have the decryption keys for things like BitLocker to be able to get access to those disks so that you can actually gain access to the system and be able to make these updates. And unfortunately, many organizations, the majority more than likely, if they've outsourced their IT and they've outsourced these kind of systems to other companies, probably are not doing proper key management and they're not controlling their own encryption decryption keys with regards to these systems. And by trying to fix it themselves, they probably won't be able to because they'll require these keys to be able to go and decrypt the systems first before they can actually go in and actually modify the system and delete the files they need to delete. So we have a triple problem. We have CrowdStrike making a mistake and creating code inside the kernel level, which actually does serious execution and it's corrupt. It has a secondary side of this problem where a lot of companies, unfortunately, have outsourced their IT to other organizations. And that, yes, it does reduce risk and increase profits, but profits in this case are not going to help because, well, now you're going to need boots on the ground because any, any physical access can allow you to sort this out. And on top of that, if they're not doing proper key management and they're not handling or having backups of their own keys for the disks and to get into these systems, then you're going to have real problems getting into the systems to actually fix the problem. So here's the problem. The fault, step one, right? This is what's happened. So the faulty update was deployed without adequate testing in plain sight. Okay. The issue began with the release of CrowdStrike's update containing a critical bug. This update was pushed out to systems globally as part of routine security enhancement. But here's the problem. 
In step two, I'm highlighting it. There's a file corruption. Okay, the bug in the update caused a critical file, which is typically a, a system driver or a device driver. Typically, in this case, it's a device driver to be filled with blanks, with zeros. Instead of actually filling it up with necessary data to go and do the correct calls to the CPU and then the CPU to make the correct calls to the RAM and the disk to be able to do any kind of processing. It was a file that was added into the update called C with a number of characters and a 291.sys file. And essentially there were zeros in that file, which meant when it ran to execute this file, there was nothing to execute. And it just goes into a loop and it constantly looks for data and looks for data and looks for instructions, looks for calls to the CPU and the RAM and it can't find them. And there's a system failure because the kernel doesn't understand what to do next. See, this effectively rendered the file useless, akin to receiving a crucial package filled with nothing but empty space. Okay. So, this kernel driver failure, when the system attempted to use this corrupted file, it triggers a kernel driver failure. This is analogous, analogous sorry, to like a body's nervous system malfunctioning, right? Leading to like a complete shutdown, right? And the system-wide impact, the kernel driver failure has resulted in all these widespread crashes manifesting in this blue screen of death, right? And it's got far-reaching consequences across the board. Right, that's the problem because it's a kernel level error. Now, what you need to do is a couple of things. This is the step by step resolution. OK, you start up the system with number one, you boot up into safe mode if it's possible. OK, and if it's not, you more than likely will have to get into the system by having the decryption keys to be able to bypass BitLocker, which now unfortunately means you're going to be exposing the system just temporarily. So you'll start your system in safe mode by pressing the F8 when the machine's booting up. This loads your Windows operating system with minimal drivers and services without necessarily executing any additional code inside the kernel so they can prevent any problematic sort of CrowdStrike software from actually running. In step two, you need to navigate to CrowdStrike's directory. Open up the file explorer, go and navigate into the C colon Windows System32 drivers CrowdStrike. And inside there, it should contain the CrowdStrike driver files, or at least one file. Find the name or find the file named with C, whatever the characters are with the 291.sys, and then delete the file. This will remove the corrupted file that's causing the system crashes. However, if you do find more files with that 291 at the end of that file name before there's a dot extension, Delete all the 291s. Don't just delete one of them. Delete all the 291s. In that folder, just remove all the files. Then when you restart, restart in normal mode. And hopefully, uh, it should really work. But hopefully, the system will reboot into the normal mode. And you should have now your system back in active mode without any problems with the blue screen of death. Now, if you haven't followed this procedure, just try to follow these steps carefully, but at the end of the day, remember that you may have to, unfortunately, in many cases, still have to get to the system to boot up safely by bypassing the BitLocker encryption process. And unfortunately, you're going to need the right keys for that so that you can get access to the system so that you can do what you need to do. And this is going to be a big problem for a lot of companies where they won't be able to do this. And unfortunately, they'll be rendered unusable for quite some time, okay, until you get those keys. So quite an important set of steps. Now, in terms of preventing future incidents, well, here's the thing, right? Well, the CrowdStrike issue ha has been resolved on their side, you know, through, through fixing whatever they needed to fix. And also they're giving you the way of actually fixing it. And the method uh, preventing similar incidents in the future requires a massive multifaceted approach. You see, organizations need to consider implementing a much more robust procedure for all software updates. Hence, I mentioned in my previous uh, videos, my last three that I've done, uh, in terms of having a framework for updates using something like Intoto, using something like that Microsoft certification process in terms of updates. Uh, you know, the, it needs to involve that in terms of dealing with the operating system and how the kernel level works. And then this could have also involved more things like staged rollouts, right? And better testing, which in this case, obviously the testing wasn't done right. 
And um, well, these updates can be initialized in such a way that they're done in very small updates, small locations, and distributed very carefully, slowly across the board without just launching a massive update across the world, which to me is basically a self-inflicted distributed denial of service. But it doesn't bode very well and it doesn't look very good for CrowdStrike, especially not for George Kurtz as a CEO of the company, considering he's been gaslighting the world and talking nonsense on social media. You know, at the end of the day, this requires manual intervention by IT professionals and security professionals. And this is going to be very tricky to deal with. It's going to have a lot of losses around the world financially and hopefully, hopefully, God willing, no human life loss because this is really dangerous type of stuff. Now, additionally, maintaining an up-to-date system and backups and keeping your key management solution in place will allow you to be able to establish a decent rollback if you need it. The problem is, though, it's also another fault problem, and that is you must have better complement of IT and professional security professionals in your company. Don't just fire people, let people go because you want to automate everything and use artificial intelligence and machine learning. I've been seeing that for the last four years to five years where companies want to just make more profits. They want to make their shareholders happier or it looks better on the balance sheet. And they've let go of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of trained, highly skilled, very hardworking IT professionals and security professionals, which they're not going to need for this type of problem, because you're going to need boots on the ground to manually go and fix these systems. So it's very important. And also on the other side as well, IT information, security professionals, and just normal IT pros, they, they need to be informed about these potential risks and they need to understand that some of these things shouldn't really be signed off until rigorous testing has taken place. And of course, you know, regular training and simulations with teams and that to really harness what these problems are is quite important. Okay. So what are the conclusions and the key takeaways? All right, we've got a four step problem here. There's complexity happening here. There's interplay with complexity here. CrowdStrike's incident really underscores the complex interplay between cybersecurity measures and stability. And it highlights the need for much more careful core management, kernel mode operational management, and f exceptionally rigorous testing that needs to be done which unfortunately in this case has got far reaching consequences at an error level that is just, it's a worldwide meltdown. There needs to be a more balanced approach to software updates. This is quite crucial to weigh out the rapid sort of security response based on also the importance of staying up and running 24 seven. This incident may reprompt or may prompt companies to sort of reevaluate the update deployment strategy and you really shouldn't be doing any major updates unless it's been thoroughly tested on parallel systems. Parallel systems for quite some time until you're 100% happy with those rollouts and then they should be implemented at a trial basis before it goes global. This is a real failure from CrowdStrike and from the companies doing the rollouts and the updates. Really, the, the, the key to this is being more prepared, right? The more you prepare, the better this is going to be. And easier to handle and IT professionals need to be more prepared obviously to diagnose and resolve these complex issues. However, the problem is you need to have these IT professionals and security professionals in your company, right? And you need to also understand the differences. Of course, IT people do this. They understand the difference between kernel mode and user mode, as well as the, the sort of anatomy of system crashes and so on. But it's not something that IT professionals and security professionals lack in. They do understand this very well. There needs to be a little bit more in terms of preparedness. Business needs to understand the preparedness side. You need to have disaster recovery plans in place. You need to have incident response and business continuity plans in place for this. And not just rely on what the Falcon software at CrowdStrike is doing, because they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do as a piece of software does. The difference is because they operate on all those layers, Unfortunately, in this case, it's rendered these systems unusable. So actually, it's partly their fault and partly companies, other companies' fault. And of course, continuous learning will help quite a bit. So hopefully, this little breakdown has given you a little bit of insight as to what's happening and gives you uh, the necessary sort of impetus to know, okay, when we have to come across this fix, these are a couple of things we need to think about. 
things like BitLocker to bypass them and use sort of the encryption keys and decryption keys to get in. Go into the right location, get into safe mode, get those files, delete those files, reboot the system cleanly, and then obviously you should be up and running after that. And bear in mind, more than likely, that update will not be used again, obviously, because CrowdStrike will have fixed it by now. But the problem is you have to reevaluate how you're deploying these updates. And as a company, when you deploy updates, they shouldn't be global updates just because, you know, CrowdStrike or any other company for that matter decides, yep, it's a good update. That goes the same for Microsoft updates and Linux updates and Mac updates. There's no difference here. It needs to go through thorough testing. This CrowdStrike problem has been an absolute failure in every single level. It's been a failure in the development and the updating of the code. No rigorous testing was done. Mistakes were made. No decent approval stages were in, packed, were, were in place, I should say. It, they didn't check all the testing to see what the impact would be, and they just released an update. There was no final confirmation between, say, the uh, companies and between the uh, CrowdStrike software. Right? They didn't go through a process of the Windows, in this case, Windows Hardware Quality Lab certification process. There's a bypass in this scenario. And unfortunately, because of that, well, that simple mistake has rendered systems unusable globally around the world. On the other hand as well, the other side of the problem is, like I said, companies don't have enough IT professionals and security professionals now to go and fix this job because, well, they've let go of these people around the world for the last five years, selfishly because of profits. And now that we're going to need people like this in industry, now they're going to have to run around like headless chickens in terms of companies, and there will be major financial losses. Of course, the biggest other issue is the users. The users are being disadvantaged in such a way across the board, across so many sectors, and there is no way for insurance to pay for this. An airline, for example, that it's cancelled thousands and thousands. We're looking at well over 20,000 flights just on the first day alone. Airlines cannot really pay that money back to companies because actually this fault rests not just with the airline or the airport company, it rests across the board accountable all the way up to Counter-Strike, uh, Counter to CrowdStrike. So actually, like I've said in my previous videos, there needs to be an accountability board set up, an association set up that's not funded by the companies that are funding CrowdStrike. The companies that are funding CrowdStrike are companies like Vanguard, BlackRock, and so on. This company needs to be completely independent and has to have major oversight, both technical oversight and uh, public oversight over all these updates because look what's happened. CrowdStrike has been left unfederated and unfederated and basically they've made an update to the kernel space which now has rendered not just the fact that it's rendered systems unusable, it's actually their software which usually protects systems has actually rendered the systems unusable which effectively means it's completely violated every single software level agreement that they have in place with every client which is 24,000 customers and, and counting. That is a lawsuit of humongous proportions that needs to be launched and more importantly a massive audit needs to take, needs to take place at CrowdStrike for this very, very unusual mishap. Considering that CrowdStrike has a reputation of being very good software, this kind of mistake is completely inexcusable. And uh, it is a very difficult fix because, not because of the complexity of the fix, but because of gaining access into the system physically and having to, in many cases, necessarily bypass encryption without corrupting anything. And in some cases, we will find that companies will lose their systems, they will lose da uh, their data, and they won't be able to boot up. And in, it'll probably be the case that in some companies, well, they if they can't get the decryption keys to work correctly, they probably won't be able to get access to the systems, which means they'll either have to recreate all the systems again and rebuild all the data, or they'll have to close as companies. And this really as an accountability has to rest with not just the companies, but it has to go up to the top at CrowdStrike. This is something that cannot be skirted around. This is an, an absolute disaster across the world. And here's the thing. It's not even a coordinated or malicious attack by hackers, which is 
far more dangerous and far more superior than this attack could ever be. Because this is an attack. It's just self-inflicted, distributed denial of service. So it is a difficult problem to solve. And I, and I hope this little presentation has kind of helped people understand a little bit more technically what's going on. And also gives you a little bit of instructions on how to do this and how to fix the problem. And also just to put people at rest and understand, well, unfortunately, this is a very difficult thing to fix because it's not an easy thing to deal with cybersecurity. As you well see now, having to have that kind of level access as an application to be able to do rapid response and real time threat analytics gives us the problem of, unfortunately, the side effect of having an internal possible issue that could render everything unusable. And that does require far better testing, far better scrutiny, far better auditing definitely a far better certification process with at least the Windows Hardware Quality Labs process and certification, which I'm shocked that it didn't go through this correctly. And more importantly, very, very well set up, staged approach of software updates where it's fully validated across the board. And the validation mustn't just be from the actual CrowdStrike side or any company that has software like this, but it must also be from the company side that's implementing the software for protection. They must have the final verification say when it comes to an update. They must have this tested across systems that are not necessarily live to be 100% sure that these things can be valid. And then the implementation of the updates needs to take place. Yes, the downside is updates will take longer to happen. Yes, the downside once again is we might be a little bit more exposed to a potential exploit that might exist or might be found in the, in the wild, but at the end of the day, it doesn't produce a result like this, which is far more dangerous considering it's hitting mission critical life threatening systems around the world. So hopefully this little document and this presentation gave you a bit of insight. I hope that you can get over this and solve this problem for all of you who are out there. I feel for all the administrators and IT professionals and security professionals that I have to deal with this today and for the next couple of weeks, if not the whole month. I feel really sad for you guys, but I hope that you can actually get in there and get it done because it'll show, you know, what we are all about as IT professionals and security professionals. We get the job done. And to managers and CEOs and directors of companies out there, I have one call out to you. Stop firing people that are trained and highly skilled and highly work and they're, they're very hard working people because this is just the, the, the tip of the iceberg of what can happen. Just the tip of the iceberg. And if this can happen now, as we get more and more and more advanced with software and hardware and all the attacks that are coming out, we're going to have far more reachable pro problems. We're going to have far more repercussions, more dangerous repercussions down the road. So you have got to start building your IT security teams, your IT professionals, your administrators. You have to start rebuilding your companies. You've gone down the wrong road and you've got to take a loop back and not worry just about profits because now not only have you lost a lot of systems, a lot of productivity, a lot of downtime, you're going to have the public on your back forever from now on they will never forget this problem and on CrowdStrike perspective you've got a clean house you've got to sort yourselves out people and as a ceo george kurtz stop gaslighting we are very intelligent we know what we're talking about we know what the problem is okay be a good leader get this thing done put a task force together, completely independent, not funded by any of the big companies to oversight and oversee everything your software does. It'll give you an auditing process, something to fall back on. It'll be easier. You won't have to deal with this backlash you're going to get and all these lawsuits you're more than likely going to have to get. And unfortunately, it'll be way beyond class action lawsuits. This is going to be serious damage to CrowdStrike. But it doesn't mean the CrowdStrike is a bad software, bad application. Please, people understand this. It is a very necessary system. It's very well designed for what it does. But in this scenario, it is not well designed. It is very difficult for it to be well designed for this case, because when a kernel has to protect the system because of this, mal this 
indication or oh, there's something that's about to crash the system and crash the kernel it has to shut the system down to protect itself so effectively it's too good for its own for its own good if that makes any sense it's doing something too good compared to what it should do and unfortunately to protect the system it has to shut it down and because it goes into this loop because of that stupid little file that was left behind in the code that has zeros which makes no sense to me in terms of how developers could even allow a file like that to even be compiled, which means you have definitely bypassed huge steps here. This loop is a problem, and now these systems are rendered physical, access only, you can't do things remotely, and it's going to require everyone to get involved in this. Right. So hopefully I've given a bit of light. I've shed some light into this. Thank you for watching. Thank you to all my subscribers. I appreciate your time. Thank you to anybody new. Anybody who's interested and wants to watch more videos, please click the subscribe and the notification because it just tells YouTube uh, to go and give my videos to other people and at the same time tells you when I create a new video. Thank you for watching. And once again, it's Demetrius here, signing out.